Hello, animation fans, and welcome to another iAnimate podcast. I'm your host, Larry Vasquez, and you are listening to episode 100. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity here real quick just to thank all of our guests that we've had throughout the years. Um, it's been truly humbling and a neat opportunity to be able to sit down with you and pick your brain to talk about this industry that we all enjoy, um, to hear about your journey, the cool projects you've worked on, um, the anecdotes and the insight that you've given. So thank you so, so much for uh, taking the time with us. Um, thank you to our audience who have supported us throughout the years, the emails that you've talked about, how much you've appreciated it. So thank you for supporting us in this, as well as my co-host, Rick Arroyo, uh, who's been with me throughout this time. So a huge thank you. In episode 100, we have Lino DeSalvo joining us. Uh, Lino has been in the industry, very well known. He's been working at the highest level. He's been at Disney for, I think it was 14, 15 years. Um, from Chicken Little all the way to the blockbuster Frozen, as well as uh, supervising animator, leading animators on those things, and then uh, branched off to go on and to direct. And it was just a really, really cool opportunity to talk with Lino, um, to hear his journey in this. Again, it's one of the things I love about doing these podcasts. And then also to be able to briefly talk about the workshop that he is going to uniquely be doing for us here at iAnimate. Um, so definitely check it out. Um, hey, Rick, I'm glad you're able to join us, man. This is our 100th podcast. I was hoping Jason could get in here. He, I was telling him, uh, Lino, that he was in on a meeting. So um, I know. But I'm super excited for this one here. Um, Very excited. I mean, an amazing guest, Lino. Thank you so much. I know yeah. we've been talking, we've been sharing. I'm really pumped about this. I was <laughs> I was like, I got to go, guys. This is my thing. <laughs> like, I got I to gotta, I gotta go. I appreciate you making this. <laughs> All and right, dude, yeah. you you already have the radio voice. <laughs> right, you already got that thing that I think we should. Ju I, I just want to listen to you. Speak. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate that. They uh, radio voice, but a uh, face for radio too. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Well, let's jump into it. Lino, um, I'm super, super excited to have you on this podcast. As I mentioned, this is our 100th podcast. Um, and so it's just been, we've had some great guests. And so it's really neat to be able to get in another great guest in for our 100th podcast. Um, you've got an immense uh, backlog as far as work that you've done in studios at the highest level here. So um, just really want to say thank you so much for joining us on this podcast. Dude, awesome to be here. Thank you. Killer. Um, I always like to kind of go back to and lead up to where we're kind of at now. Um, you mentioned, uh, I think in your bio, you're, uh, are you from Italy originally? I am first generation Italian American. Okay. So I like to hear, I, I like to get behind the person behind the, the, uh, the art form here. So how did you get into animation? Um, I think with a lot of luck, <laughs> uh, honestly, I, um, uh, dude, I was one of those kids that always loved drawing. I think that's a okay. common thread, right? And in, in all of us, like I was a daydreamer. Um, I used to get in trouble in school for, for okay. doing comic strips during class. Yep, and, yep. And um, it was something I enjoyed so much that f up until I was like 17, I didn't, it didn't compute that that thing that I love so much could be a job, right? Yeah, like it yeah. took me going to college and studying criminal justice and totally going in a, the wrong path for the universe somehow to be like, what are you doing? <laughs> and then slowly like realizing like, my God, what, what have I done? And, um, and stopping and then, applying to Vancouver film school. And, and then this is 19, this is 97. Okay. This is 90. So, so the computers back then were so expensive to run the software. So students and I, we were night shift, day shift, got into that. Um, and one thing led to another we put up in our first assignment in in art school and it was the first time in my life where the thing that all the students were sharing the thing that i put up was was good okay <laughs> it wasn't just lost and it was like oh this is and i remember saying to myself too like oh i'm pretty good at this kind of stood out huh it, it i'm like oh yeah so 
so from that moment on that motivated me even more um and then one thing led to another and uh um i put a portfolio together i sent it to pixar to disney feature animation everywhere and and i got responses from all of them and i chose disney animation how how can you not right yeah <laughs> and then this is the time also that um toy story had come out years before um uh a bug's, bug's life. life yeah and i think monster zinc just came out okay um or was coming out but the year that i graduated everyone's reels had to do with insects because bugs life was so popular. Gotcha. Yeah. 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 Um, and then I just got lucky, man. The stars aligned and uh, you get that message on your answering machine. And, um, and I thought it was my buddy. So I called my buddy up. I'm like, Ben, man, that's mean to get <laughs> a message like that. He goes, I swear it wasn't me. I was like, holy. <laughs> um, so what was it? I mean, you're coming right out of school here to jump into one of the highest levels of animation. What was it that kind of um, got you in that door there? What was it that they saw that were like, this is the guy? So so, so here, here's a quick story. And again, this I think this, it's a bit of a reflection on my my parents as um uh my parents are hustlers right like always wheeling and dealing for a pair <laughs> of shoes and and i have an entrepreneurial spirit just like my family that's cool so i remember hearing the story um uh, uh while i was in school that oh they're they're thinking of bringing in a couple of Disney animators to come visit the school. And I was like, whoa, my God, I'm going to meet a real life Disney animator. This is incredible. Um, so, I, you know, I'm working hard. Again, more motivation. So the day that they came to visit, we're in the lab. And do you guys remember the big TVs on those, those like wheelie? Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. And, you know, there's like a, a VCR tape deck in the bottom and so we're in the lab and I'm feeling pretty good about my reel, still incredibly insecure, right? Like what, what are the pros going to say about your work? So I had this idea that um, I was going to uh, take the TV, rotate it around, and just as the two Disney animators turned the corner, I was going to hit play on the TV I love and actually it. and play my, my, my demo reel. Uh -huh. <laughs> so they turn the corner and I'm shitting my pants <laughs> and I'm like, fuck, here it goes. Boing. Hit play. They stop. They watch the reel. And they're like, Oh, it's pretty good. So I ask questions and we get into a conversation. I address their notes and then I sent the reel directly to both of them at Disney. Very cool. Make a long story short, they hired me. Okay. So um, the moral of that story is uh, you got you got to find a way to get eyes on your stuff, right? Like as an artist, mm. I, I think it's super easy to feel like it's impossible that no one's ever going to notice me. I How do I... There's always a way, right? There's... You know, there's all these animation conventions, bringing an iPad, showing somebody's stuff, getting feedback. Um, but that's how I got in. Nice, nice. Who were the artists, if you don't mind me asking? Um, uh, so he ended up being a very close friend of mine. His name is Stu Burris. And he was working at Dream Quest Images, which was owned by Disney. Okay. Um, so I started off at Dream Quest and I was doing visual effects in the beginning. Gotcha, gotcha. So I was doing creatures, Mighty Joe Young, Inspector Gadget. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Like, re like real physics based stuff. And it was just, and I, I worked on 102 Dalmatians, Reign of Fire. Um, and that stuff was just so hard. And at the end of the day, the reward was no one even knew what you did because <laughs> it looks photo real, right? Um, uh, and then, and then, 
Disney animation was going through a phase where they were looking for a few more artists. Um, and then a few of us went to feature. Okay. So what was your first project over at Disney? Over at Disney, it was, well, I worked on a bunch of stuff that never got made. Okay. <laughs> right. Because Disney at the beginning, I think they were one of, I don't know if they were the last, but they didn't, they didn't hop on that CG feature. Right movement very soon right so there i worked in a bunch of stuff that never really materialized okay but the first thing that i worked on i got made was chicken little okay so that's where you worked on with jason ryan that's right all right so lena and i were talking beforehand that him and jason ryan go way back so he said he's got some stories about him um he said all good all good <laughs> um <laughs> <I> promise <laughs> okay so from there you know um what was your it sounds like when you talked about very uh, realistic and physics um, emphasis on the stuff that you did beforehand, was that honing your skills as far as uh, the body mechanics and things of that nature? Yeah, it was, you know, it's really interesting. It's a great question. I think the more that I learned about creature, I think it, I think it, it, it made learning broader caricatured mm -hmm. subtle acting stuff more difficult okay how so because the the way i learn the physics stuff is is there there's this just natural locomotion of the way things move in nature and the weightiness and it i just felt like the more i did that the more I would brute force my timing and just throw things just so they, it always felt natural. Okay. And then I remember when I started doing performance stuff, I had to break so many of those habits to give myself the freedom of broad mm -hmm. movement, what led what, thinking, subtext, acting. Um, yeah, I mean, listen, I, I'm happy I did both. Uh, could I do visual effects, creature stuff now? I don't think so. <laughs> if I did, it would look like a guy in a costume probably. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're such specialty uh, forms of animation, I think. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, we did a podcast, um, Matthew DeMuro. Uh, he did a lot of VFX and then he, he went on and uh, animated on uh, Cloud with a Chance of Meatballs. And I think it was, I don't know if it was the first or second one, but um, he, I think he had the uh, burger with the spider uh, things. And they said at first when he came out on that one, it looked like a VFX type creature. They're like, looks great, but we got to, you know, and then all of a sudden he had to do the same thing, kind of had to break out of that and like, okay, and really kind of push it. So yeah, definitely different disciplines as far as what the end result is. But I just was curious because I know we've had some other podcasts with guys who've worked with mocap and they said, hey, look, you know, I, I, when I jumped to the other forms of animation, I learned a lot through that. I learned the, the physics and the body mechanics, how the hips actually work, which then kind of now when I go into more cartoony and broader animation, I'm at least basing it on real world type uh, and know where to break it. So I was just kind of curious if that was similar yeah. with your case. Yeah, it, it feels like, you know, I've animated so many horses and dogs in my career mm. that there's, you know, for quadruped movement, there's more or less a, there's a template there, right? Like the back legs are extremes, the front legs are crossing, the front legs are extremes, the back legs mm -hmm. are crossing. The transition from a gallop, from a trot to a gallop, like there's, it's, it's science, right? So there's, there are things that I feel like footfall, timing, pivoting, but I felt like once I got into performance stuff, all that stuff can be wrong as long as the acting and the subtext and the, and the believability and the eyes and the brows and the mouth. And as long as that stuff is right, because that's where you're, that's where you're looking. Gotcha. Right? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's pretty cool. That, that stuff was like, the minute I realized that, like my first few scenes that I animated in Chicken Little, like I was like, hey, hip tear, step. And then <laughs> and my, and it just looked vacant. And then as soon as I was, I felt free of like, 
Who cares where the foot is falling? Gotcha. Just capture like, what is the character saying and what's leading what, right? Like, and then, then, then I felt like my animation changed. Plus, I mean, I can't be, can't be naive to thinking guys like Jason Ryan, Eric Goldberg, Glenn Keane, like these are people that I'm I'm animating with, right? right, right. And they're, and they're giving me critiques, and I'll 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 eventually end up supervising with them, right? So, like, you're gonna be, you're gonna be great regardless. <laughs> you've got these eyes critiquing what you're doing. So again, very lucky guy. That's awesome. Was that a difficult transition to kind of break out of some of that, like you said, though, initially? Or is it like, like you said, it was freeing, obviously, but was it a difficult transition? It, I would say it took me a movie. Okay. Yeah, it took me, um, you know, and Jason was, Jason was really, was, was an awesome person to work with, right? Like he was, he was honest and he was super talented. He came from a hand-drawn background. So the way he critiqued stuff mm -hmm. was not only, um, not only was it verbal, but there was, you can put a picture to it, right? Yeah, so yeah, he yeah. left the room, crisp, was crystal clear. Gotcha. Um, yeah. And then after, after Chicken Little, I felt like not only do I got it, but like, then I went in and this, I know this is going way down the line, but then I got into acting, improv, I just became obsessed with performance. You did start doing that on uh, uh, on the side? On the side after Chicken Little. Um, yeah, I just became obsessed with acting theory. So did you take it, did you do some of that kind of stuff for the, um, I guess for lack of a better term, love of acting or was it to kind of bring it back into animation or both? To bring it back to animation. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I. Yeah. The thing is, I kept finding the common denominator of the stuff that I liked was the was the stuff, the kind of stuff that Glenn Keane and James Baxter were doing. Right. It was stuff that felt like it had a soul mm -hmm. and it just moved me. Like I was just like, I love I, I just love their stuff. <laughs> and I'm like that. That's the kind of animator I want to be. Right. Like there's there's cartoony animators and then there's there's so many animators that can do it all. I'm not that talented. So my my thing was I was the I was the person that was cast um those fireside scenes, right? The 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 emotional stuff, the revealing stuff of characters. That's awesome. I animated a lot of stuff of Flynn sitting in the chair in Rapunzel. Mm. I animated a lot of this I animated Flynn dying in Rapunzel. Spoiler alert. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, like th those are the, and, and as a supervisor, I would always cast my stuff, the stuff that got me really nervous. Oh yeah. Like I would give my stuff, I would cast my stuff, things that scenes that I would say, like, there's no way I can do this. Oh, I like that. And I would care. I would give it to myself and turn myself inside out. And my wife is an actor as well. She's amazing. Okay. So I had that benefit also of going home and working on stuff with her and um but I, yeah yeah what were some of the okay um i guess two-part question what were some of the things that you learned doing improv and acting and then second of all how would you encourage other artists to benefit on that would you say hey go and take some classes or hey, if you can't take some classes go do this so the first question is what were some of the things that you kind of learned from that yeah, there's so there, there's uh, Warner Laughlin is is an acting coach I still use actually mm. on all of my projects directing no matter what I'm doing I bring her in we used her at the beginning of Frozen um, and her technique is this idea of base human emotion that um, there's an there's an honest version of the performance that 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 if you if you think about where the character's been, where they're going, and the shot that you're working on is a sliver of time in the middle of all of this stuff. And and this is something that 
again, I still do to this day that I started implementing on Frozen is I build um, an emotional crescendo for every sequence that I work on, right? So, and th this is something that live action actors do. They they basically do it with themselves and their acting coach. Okay. And when I found that out via um, being in my wife's acting class, I was like, I got to bring this to the animation group. <laughs> So this idea of this emotional crescendo is um, there's a high and low for every sequence that's written in a script, right? Yeah. And being as animators, we're cast out of sequence, out of continuity. And my biggest pet peeve of animation was a lot of the times you watch an animated movie and everything feels like it's on 12. Mm. The animator is Every animator is trying to outdo the other. Gotcha, gotcha. And you're six minutes into the movie and you don't give a shit about anything. Uh-huh. Right? Every, they're shouting at you. And I remember um, being lucky enough to be the head of animation on Frozen. I remember that being my agenda for the movie was we're going to build emotional crescendo boards for every single sequence and every animator is going to know what expression we're leading to in every single sequence, mm. right? And basically what we did was we tried to reserve that one expression in that sequence for that character's high or low, and we put it off limits for everyone else in the sequence. Okay. Like a live action movie, an actor would be doing that on the fly in their mind, right? Like when they get to that scene and they're doing that ugly cry and snot's coming out of their nose and they're, oh. <laughs> they're not doing that twice in the movie. Yeah. <laughs> That's once in the movie. But as animators, everyone's got a puppet and they're making everything look the same. Right. So it's devaluing moments in the movie. And I like to think that when you watch Frozen, it's easy to watch. It's kind of an invisible thing, but I think it's easy to watch and and it and it's it's emotionally um orchestrated in a way that when you get to those moments you you feel something right right and a lot of the time it's about doing less not more mm -hmm. that's great um as i mentioned to you i'm on that wing feather saga project and uh, we've had screenings of the each episode as we've kind of gone along and it's interesting to rewatch shots that i've worked on in sequence how at the time of animating them, they felt like, oh, man, this is, you know, and then all of a sudden you watch it and it's a blip. But I, it's a blip in a good way because it doesn't stand out like a sore thumb. It, it, it goes along with the story. And so it kind of goes back to what you're saying there. And it made me really understand my kind of role as an animator in that regard. So, yeah. And that, listen, um, that idea of, and this took me many years of heartache. I wish somebody would have just told me this in the beginning, is that my job as an animator was not, wasn't to hit a home run at every dailies. Right. Literally, you will have the most fruitful, successful career in animation if you, if you understood that your job as an animator is to address the notes. If you can leave dailies and bring it back with the supervisor and director's notes address, you will be loved. You will be wanted by every artist that you've ever worked with. If you go off the rails, um, that's when things start becoming a problem. But I, green animators, rookie animators don't know that, mm. right? So every shot is live or die. Every <laughs> shot is about... Oh my God, they're going to realize I'm a fraud. I'm not good enough. They're going to fire me. When, if I can tell myself, I can go back into the time machine and tell my for myself the first year or two at Disney, just address the notes. Listen to what they're saying. Just come back and just bring what they're asking. You will be loved forever. That's awesome. And as someone that's been doing this for over 25 years, uh, it, it's true. Yeah. It's just don't put too much pressure on yourself. Yes, try to surprise the director. But but once, because the beautiful thing about our craft is um, within reason, you can you can flex your muscle at the blocking phase, right? Like you can you can you can 
you can do something in blocking that makes the director go, and this happens to me all the time when I'm reviewing work. Oh, I never thought of it that way. There's no bigger compliment. Yeah, yeah. Right? And now, once you get those notes, now it's about addressing the notes. So you still have that freedom of flexing your muscle, right? Sometimes when people hear the, just address the notes, the thing that I think of right away is, but what if the supervisor is wrong? <laughs> and that's common too, right? The supervisor is giving you garbage notes and you go there and it's wrong. But I think good supervisors in the room say, that's my bad, right? We were trying to do X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. And there's no, there's no harm in that. Yeah, yeah. So when you get, uh, cause you've both led, you've been in supervising animation roles, you've been a director. What is it that you look forward when you see, or, or let me back that up. How can you ease the artist's mind as what you just said from your perspective going, Hey, this is what I'm looking for. If I get something that is surprising, not in a good way, it's okay because now I'm going to start addressing notes. Is that kind of how you look at that? How can you ease the artist's mind in that regards? First, yeah, yeah, first, that, first pass. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think Larry, I think that's right. So um, I think what's really important speaking as someone that was a director, um, that, that's a director that was an executive that, 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 that's an animator. I think if you can do an emotional crescendo review with everyone doing that sequence. And again, this is even before launching, casting anyone on anything. We're all together in the room. And as the director, they're gonna hear my reasoning for the ups and downs emotionally in just this one sequence. And then the next day, once they digest that, we'll do, uh, we'll do issuing and casting of the, of the shots. What I found is if I do it that way, things are, when I'm seeing stuff from the animator and blocking, they're really close, right? I Because I've all of a sudden, I've, I've jettisoned that, that vacant feeling of, and I remember feeling it as leaving dailies or leaving the issuing session going, I think I know what they want. <laughs> that is so dangerous, right? Because... You, if if you're not getting it at that point, that shot is going to be in like iteration all over hell, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so iteration work, purgatory. You're you're yeah, working so your I way worked, up. I recently directed a little Christmas special. Um, it's it was a sub five million dollar project, and it was forty four minutes. The the closest thing budget wise that I did before that was 65 million. Wow. So all of a sudden I'm, I'm faced with a story that I love, a charming project and how, how can we do this? So implementing the things that I learned on the big budget stuff and putting on a little TV show, it, it saved, it saved my mental health. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah knowing that everyone knows which way the ship is pointed in and we're all going that way. Yeah. Yeah. I had a, uh, a shot where it was that all over the place. Cause I wasn't, and it was not my fault not to ask enough questions. And it was kind of one of those ones, Hey, look, we're, she, she's doing something right. We just got to keep her busy and stuff like that. But that was left still real vague in my mind. So I just, and it went all over the place. And I learned my lesson from that to continue to ask more questions after that. And so, yeah, if, you, if you're if you in a position like you're talking about here, that clarity really does free up things for the animator. Yeah, and if you, I think what a lot of animators don't realize either is, because, you know, it's, it's an anxious time, right? To speak up, your supervisors are there and the director is there. It's, it's easy not to say anything, but I think what animators need to know is um, it makes you look good. Mm. If you're in dailies and you're asking questions about your shot, it forces the directors to think, it forces the supervisors to think, and it, and it reiterates like as a director, I get certain questions where it makes you pause and go, Yes, that is the right thing. Let's or or all right, everyone slow down. That's a great question. Maybe we're doing this. So yeah, I would bring like animators should feel like 
if you've got questions going in, ask them. Gotcha. Hey, Rick, also you've directed. You care. Also shows that you care about like what you're crafting, right? Mm -hmm. It makes you more engaged. So I like that. Yeah. I was going to say, Rick, you've directed and stuff before oh, as yeah. well as, are these some of the things that you're like, hey, I've noticed as well, I've had to implement or I need to implement? Yes, yes. I mean, like right now, it's, it's actually, you know, I'm enjoying this because I'm taking notes, not only for the questions, <laughs> follow-up questions, but, you know, it's just like a summary of a, of a, of like a one-on-one -on -one session, one-on-one um, -on -one session masterclass, you know, but <laughs> yes, when you're directing, like really understanding that you're crafting performance, but before even crafting performance, I want to understand who the characters are and like, you know, saying, you know, where, where are they coming from? Where are they going? What are their obstacles? What's their motivation? You know, what drives them forward in the story? And then by understanding that, how do I, how do I play that for, for the audience? And, you know, games a little bit different. There's a lot of things that, uh, that we've taken from. And I love that, you know, you're talking about, you know, uh, acting and acting, you know, acting coach, uh, to me, that is, you know, really key. And, and I use a lot of theories that, you know, whether it comes from YouTube or whether, I, you know, I meet someone on set, I'm always exchanging and trying to utilize these things, um, you know, when when we're directing. Mm -hmm. So uh, to me, this is this is it. And even as an animator, you were talking about, um, you know, asking questions, uh, being brave, you know, it, it's good to ask questions. It shows that you're not going in blind, that you're really thinking it through. It helps with the planning. So, yeah, absolutely. We're yes. we're totally, uh, I think we're approaching a lot of, of uh, directing in similar ways. Okay, so my second question to that was kind of like, what can the artist do? And it kind of draws me back to some of the stuff. Obviously, we that's why we have top professionals teach at iAnimate. Um, who have been in roles like you or under people like you and gleaning from you. Um, we've watched a lot of film and, and film analysis, but what are some of the other things would you recommend animators jump into uh, even just a short term of improv to get that? Or, um, Hey, if you're not feel comfortable with that, here's another route. What would you kind of suggest for animators to, I think at the end of the day, we all want or enjoy that acting through our, uh, characters, but we're to kind of go back to what you're talking about here. We're not all trained actors either. So what is it that we can now level up our game as animators? What would you suggest? Yeah, I think, I think at a minimum acting theory should be something that even if you don't part participate necessarily, but you understand the, pro the process of a genuine performance Listen, something, something, I, I'm not sure scientifically what's happening, but when you turn that camera on and you're standing in front of it and you start acting, for some reason, something happens where it, it's difficult to find this genuine performance, right? So, so I want, I want to challenge that, right? You know, we haven't finished our talks, <laughs> you know, but I always wanted, um, I like to challenge my teams or the, the teams I'm working with is to really understand the character so they can embody the character, right? A little bit of method there. So I always talk about, do you even know the character? Like before you jump during your reference or you're mm -hmm. looking for reference, like, do you know this character? Is this character real? Like, do you know how they talk, walk, feel, how they would react? So do you, um, you know, do you think or prep or present, you know, your characters to the team saying this is who this person is? Yeah, I mean, um, so on Frozen, what we did is, um, one, I brought in an acting coach. So she brought in two professional actors. We went through the whole script and the actors performed the whole movie. Wow. And we got to watch professional actors take on the characters we were about to animate. Mm. Secondly, I hosted an inside the actor studio style interview with the voice actors. That's cool. where we spoke about process, um, their thoughts on the characters, acting, their approach to the character and the performance and why certain choices are being made. 
So I try to do all of that stuff um, so that by the time that the animators cast something, we all know them. Like the characters are friends, right? Mm. Like, oh yeah, like in Frozen, when Anna gets nervous, she bites her bottom lip, right? <laughs> we all know everyone's traits. And we write bios for every character. I mean, it's exhaustive, super, super fun, but I obsess about that stuff. Mm. But at, at the end of the day, there are certain actors, certain animators that they'll get in front of a camera and their performance is terrible, right? Yeah. They're shy, they're introverts, and that's totally okay. Right. So in that case, what I say is there are things even in those performances where truth, you can see, you can see items where the way an eyebrow goes up, the little breath that you took, the little turn, the twitch, the thing that you, the way your body reacted before you said that line. Those are the things I try to pull out of the live action reference and tell the, I like to view their reference and say, these are the things you can use. Mm. And then another technique we can do too is, dude, some of the best animators I know, they're, they're introverts. And they're just not comfortable doing stuff like that. Right. Is they'll have another animator do the performance and then they interpret stuff that they like. They'll work with the director or so I, I always think there's a creative workaround. Right. But I think that as long as we all know that Christoph is that guy that lives in the tundra and would rather be hanging out with the reindeer than people we're all animating the same character. Gotcha. Right. Like, yeah, yeah. I think as long as, and I'm doing that, you know, I'm in development right now and um, I'm chomping at the bit to get to that phase. Like we're, <laughs> we're on the second draft right now and I'm, and I'm talking to acting coaches and actors and I'm like, I can't wait. Um, it's my favorite part of the process. That's awesome. But it's because you're, you're really getting to know the characters and like you in a, in a one sentence, you defined him like you really knew him. And I think that's something that animators um, need to take in consideration in, in a simple line. Can you describe who this character is in any situation? You know, so I think that's a, a real gold nugget um, right there. Yeah. Yeah. And Rick, I would go. Um, yeah. And then the, the nice thing about having the sequence is broken out into these emotional crescendos for the whole movie is we're getting to the animators know like, Oh, we're getting to that spot where the character is going to be hurt. Right. The character is revealing something genuine. It's nice for everyone to know like, Oh yeah, everyone, this sequence is coming is, is our inventory for the next three weeks. And we're animating these type of shots. And because we've already studied them, every, everyone can, everyone's useful. Um, being sincere with your character right it's being truthful and sincere i mean isn't that the key 100 <laughs> percent. okay quick question then um that said studios such as disney have pulled artists in you know mid-production or things like that to help get the, the the project accomplished what would you do then for those artists who are jumping in maybe mid show where they're now having to kind of hit the ground running there and trying to now get those authentic acting yep. choices, not having had the. Well, one, the first thing I would say is good luck. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, the second thing I would say is watch as much of the movie as you can watch the animatic, watch what's been animated. Um, and then just make sure you're double, triple checking notes asking questions in dailies and um what's interesting is we had a few people just rap on cloudy with the chance of meatballs when we were crewing up for tangled mm -hmm. um and that talk about style differences right right um and we had a few people come in past the past the 50 percent mark of animation um yeah, and that was it's it's a challenge, right? Mm. Like, hey, the thing that I was doing that people loved on that other show are hating on me. <laughs> yeah, I found watching other people's shots 
helped me really kind of um, dial in who that character was. Stuff that had already obviously been approved um, really kind of got my mind wrapped around, okay, that's this character here. Um, so I think that's a great um, advice right there. Jumping in. Yeah. Um, okay, now you were at Disney for how many years? Almost 17. That's awesome. Um, you jumped on, you were an animator on um, Chicken Little from there. What would you work on from after that? Um, and then I worked on a few movies that never saw the light of day. Okay. Um, and that's okay. And I think and that's something that we don't talk enough about, mm. right? Because you said I took note as you were as your beginning animation, you worked on a lot of shows that no one saw, right? But, but I'm sure that you learned a lot and you were able to discover yourself and improve and mastering your, your process. So I think... That's something that animators should not be scared of. Like, I'm going to work on a show, but I might great have no point. demo reel, right? <laughs> Dude, great, great point. And then the sooner you accept that, that that's just part of the journey, The like as a director, right? Mm. The only thing people see are the things that actually make it out in the world. Yeah, the ship, yeah. Meanwhile, there's three times that work that never gets past the second animatic, the first animatic, the second mm -hmm. draft, right? So in my mind, I'm like, I've directed 15 things, <laughs> but, but people have only seen two. Mm. Um, well, that's a, that's a cool point because I, I um, as I mentioned before, I've come back from an athletic background and it, that's almost kind of like a lot of that practice, you know, that's, that's all that training, that's all that practice that no one sees, right? Until you go out on the mat or the court or whatever you're doing, right? And so that kind of goes back to a lot of what you're saying here. You may never see a lot of this, but it's still formidable for what you're doing now that what do people do see. It helped yeah. them get there. I, I would yeah. see it like, you know, you know, learning and figuring things out and building that confidence. Like early on, you were talking about, you know, finding security and being secure. And that's something that I find very important for, for us when you come to Animate. We want to help you build that confidence right. and and be willing to, you know, be excited to have the opportunity to surprise your instructor or the director, but understand how to do it the right way. So you could practice in a safe environment. And right. then when you do go in a studio, you know how to do it properly. But it is, <laughs> it is, I've learned so much personally. I've learned a lot more on, on things that, you know, that didn't really ship, but, but I still approach it with like the same dedication and, and just iterating on the process, but it 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 helps build who you become, like these years of practice. Yeah. Dude, yeah. listen, nothing can prepare you as a director to work on a critical flop. <laughs> like for me, Playmobil movie was such it was eviscerated in every imaginable way from box office to critical to if but by look back on my journey and i that had to happen to me mm. it was all part of the plan that that the learning that i've done never mind artistically but just as a human being and and mental health and being dragged so low and then having to like, listen, if you think it's difficult being a director and selling projects and pitching around town, imagine doing that after a movie like that, mm. right? Like, so, but that's exactly how my Disney career started. So when this, when this happened to me, I was like, well, of course, because my Disney career wasn't easy. Like anim animating for me is not easy. Can right? so my first few shots and dailies were getting ripped apart oh my God, I'm not good enough. What am I doing here? I should go back to New York and work with my parents in their pizzeria. Like, who <laughs> am I to think I can do this? But you persevere, you use those obstacles to make you who you are. And you know, like, I've got two features in development. I've got a graphic novel about to come out. That's I've awesome. got a series in the world. Like, you can't, right? Like, no one cares that you... They just need you to like judge right? because people want to judge you for the last thing that you did. And your job as an artist 
is to have them judge you in what you're doing now. Mm. Right. So again, just hitting the pavement, looking forward, working, but this can turn into a whole separate podcast. You know, I was to say, you know, I love that. I absolutely love that. You know, again, I just, I analogize a lot with sports and stuff, but that's it. Um, one of my favorite wrestlers, he talked about how, um, he was known for his, what he placed at the worlds and such. And, uh, he goes, people don't realize that I had, um, tried out 12 different times before that. They didn't realize that, you know, because that's all they were looking at is his success now. But you go, if you look at it in its entirety, he had more failures in that regards. And that, if you count it that way, but those things were the things that helped him get to that. And it's the same thing, what you're talking about here. Those aren't failures. Then if you kind of learn from them and you've grown through them and now they're going to get you where you're at now. The things I learned on that movie, I mean, it, it was the greatest directorial education any human being can ask for. Mm. Traveling the world, selling it, distribution, the creative side of it, all the mistakes that I made, um, right? Because so here's here's the big challenge, and I'm sorry if I'm totally like hijacking your agenda here. No, this is great. I love um, it. The, 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 the thing for first time directors to know is your job is to make a great movie and it's not to make everyone happy in the production. Okay. I did the opposite. I tried to make every producer, every executive, everyone that gave me a note, I bent to make their note happen. Mm. And then before I know it, I had a movie that had nothing to do with what I pitched. Gotcha. So going forward, I promised myself that whatever I work on, I will have notes in my computer, post-it notes at home in my office, reminding me why I wanted to make that movie. Mm. And that will be my North star for the whole journey. Cause listen, we're making this for three years and little by little by little by little things get tweaked and changed and 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 yes you're having a great time but you're back you go into that premiere and you're like i can't believe i let this get away from me gotcha and that's easy to do over that long of a time in because little increments so, yeah it's 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 the it's the it's the crab in the boiling pot of water, right? Like, mm -hmm. oh, this is great. This feels like a hot tub. This is amazing. <laughs> and then before you know, you're being eaten at a cocktail party. <laughs> um, so yeah, listen, like I've got there, I've learned so much. And um, you know, I'm thankful for, you know, I've got an amazing wife that believes in me and mm. um and yeah. Okay, I've got a question then here, and we can kind of get back to some of the other stuff because this is just working out really well. You're going to be teaching a workshop here at iAnimate. Yeah. Um, pitch, was it Pitch Perfect or? Yeah. Rick, help me out here, buddy. Yeah, the art of pitching. pitching. Yeah, there you the go. Art, the art of pitching. pitching. There you perfect, go. And it's going to touch a lot. I so, mean, it's it's really, you know, I'm, I'm going to let Lino speak, but I can guarantee you it's going to help you become a much better animator because often as animators we come in and we're talking about how you fix your 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 knees the popping and you lose sight of before you were animating you actually need to know how to build your character present your character and pitch the idea to your director so you can help guide you get to a great piece so to me like this regardless of where you're at this is the idea, you know, when you animate, it comes from your mind, comes from your soul. You know, uh, Lena, you're talking like find the soul of your shot, find the soul of your characters. So to me, this is why I'm so excited about this, about this workshop. So sorry for just jumping in. You can tell I'm very pumped about yeah. it. Yeah, you can talk more about, about, you know, the type of things that, um, that we're going to talk about during the workshop. Right. And that's kind of why I'm bringing this up. I was telling Rick before the podcast, I'm like, hey, I, I want to keep this is our 100th podcast. Let's keep this about Lino. Um, obviously, it's super cool that we're getting you in on this on this workshop here. Um, but I feel like I can't help but bring it in because it's kind of what you're talking about here, the things that you've learned and studied, which is why you're bringing it into the workshop. So can you tell us a little bit about the workshop, what you what it's about, and but also why it ties into everything that you kind of just been talking about here? 
Yeah, so I'm I'm someone that has the fortunate experience of not only being in the room at Disney Animation with some of the most legit, amazing people, artists, and hearing them pitch, but um, I was an executive at Paramount Pictures. Mm. I was the creative de director there, and I was in the green light room for Paramount Pictures. And I saw mm. how movies got greenlit. I saw what was behind the curtain. So <laughs> as an artist, I was like, oh. Holy, so I, I I feel like um, I've taken that knowledge, and I think I'm I think I'm a pretty decent pitch person, hmm. and it's something that no one ever teaches you. When you make the decision to become a director, no one tells me, "Hey, you're the one that's going to be in the room selling the project." You have this romanticized idea that. The work will speak for itself. They'll know who I am. The concept will be so high that they'll... <laughs> it's nothing like that. <laughs> it's you. You got 20 minutes. Go. Right? And as, as an executive at Paramount, I was pitched three times a day for a year. Wow. Famous actors would come in and pitch me. The best writers on planet Earth would pitch me their stories. I've heard the worst. I've heard the best. So I was able to take all of that stuff and be like, you know what? When I go out there and start pitching, I know exactly what I'm not going to do. <laughs> and that's probably as valuable as knowing what to do. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, we're going to go over things like the movies that I've gotten into development. What did I pitch? How were they? What did I say? How did I get into the pitches? What visuals did I present? Um, things to kind of stay away from things to embrace. Um, but like Rick was saying, it's it's everything. I basically want to tell everyone um, and just share my journey, right? Of mm -hmm. filmmaking and as the head of animation at Disney, as a creative director at Paramount Animation, as an independent director, as someone that's failed miserably as a director, as someone that is in development on something so freaking awesome i can't wait to share it like <laughs> right you i've got all of these different journeys to share and um it's not about being perfect it's just about yeah it goes back to being honest right like right. i think the main thing that will <clears throat> everyone will hear me say over and over again each each class is this idea of being genuine and how you fit into the story that you're pitching, hmm. right? If those two things are organic and fit with each other, that you're pitching this idea and that your experiences organically fit into this story so that an executive hearing it cannot separate the two, you've got a movie that you can direct. Gotcha. Right? The minute it feels like you're pitching something that's cliche, or something that just feels like a movie, those, I mean, listen, unless you're an established director, I'm sure that happens, <clears throat> but as an up and coming artist, those, you need to be inseparable with the concept and the idea. Very cool. Yeah. That's neat. Yeah. I could let you know that maybe Lino doesn't know, but like, I'm definitely pumped about the class. You're going to see me in the class. <laughs> um, you know, I see Lino as like one of my coaches, like help me uh, help, help <laughs> make great products, uh, you know, at Ubisoft and, you know, work, work on some of my own pitches that I have uh, in, in the work. So I, I think as, 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 as a director, as a content director, as a creative director and, and, as, and for animators, like it doesn't get any better than this. And I can guarantee you that, and I'm, I've been taking notes. I mean, we talked to what was two weeks ago and, you know, and I'm trying to, I'm trying to get, I'm trying to work something out with, with Lino. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> we got to do something together. Right. This well, is, yeah, this is so exciting, man. I really appreciate it. Yeah. And that's just the neat part about bringing in people like you is the experience that you bring. Um, so that's why I said that's, I, I didn't want to make this podcast about that, but it was just, it felt like it just needed to because of based upon what you're kind of talking about here and just your experience, both in animation as well as directing and such. Um, so I appreciate that. 
Um, back to animation here on Disney, kind of talking about you as a director, you spent a lot of time there. It looked like you had success uh, at the highest level in regards to supervising as well as directing. Um, how quickly did that come? So um, I, I feel like I'm old school in the thinking that um, I wanted I wanted my journey to be as as legit and and organic as possible right like i didn't want any stage of my leadership to be rushed so animator to lead animator to supervising animator to head of animation like those those things happen so naturally okay that that it never I, it never felt like oh i can't do this oh my god what it just felt so organic plus Think what helped too at Disney was <clears throat> there was a group of us that felt like we were doing it together. Like we became leads together, became supervisors together, became heads of animation together, and then we all went our separate ways and directed. Mm -hmm. Like we're out in the world directing now. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've interviewed Clay Cadis, um, Patrick Osborne. Um, who else have I that have kind of gone it like your route, been at Disney, and then now gone into directing? Yeah, John um, Cars, Clay, mm -hmm. myself, um, like we we went on this journey together, and um, yeah, it's it's. I think I think when it happens organically, and your your internal clock and that little voice inside you, like for me, Frozen, at some point during the making of it, I started writing my own stuff. Okay. Like I started becoming a little bit more confident, like, oh yeah, I should, maybe I should and jot down these ideas. And so when I left, I had things to pitch and I, a point of view. Um, yeah. So that was actually going to be my second question. Maybe you kind of answered it a little bit, but maybe you can elaborate. What was the catalyst then for leaving Disney to go on to direct? Was that just kind of like you're talking about here, just that natural progression or was there just an opportunity what what was it that you're going hey i've been here for this many years yeah. again at the highest level let me leave here, <laughs> here, here's a story for you so many 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 years ago um my wife and i are chatting and i tell her um you know like i don't like you know, there's an artist that they're at one studio for 30 years, 20 years. And, and I'm like, I, you know, I don't know if that's me. Okay. And then I tell my wife, you know what? I'll know when to leave Disney when I work on a big fairy tale musical. <laughs> and then Frozen comes out <laughs> it's ginormous. And literally my wife goes, remember that thing that you said that? And I was like, oh, yes. So I, I fulfilled, like, dude, my dream was to be a Disney animator. Mm -hmm. That was my dream. Me being a supervisor, head of anime, dude, that's just cherry on the Sunday, right? Like, I am happy. <laughs> so um, Frozen happened and having, you know, being one of the, I think I was the fourth person on that movie. It was called something else in the beginning. So being one of the creative people helping to drive the creative on the movie, the, I, I felt good about my take on everything. Mm. And um, again, going back to the beginning of our conversation, I'm an entrepreneur at heart. I could not, I couldn't think of a world where I didn't take a chance on myself. Gotcha. Like I could not picture that version of my life where, dude, listen, I could have, Disney is my dream job. Disney is an awesome place to work. I loved every second. I hope I one day work with Disney again. Leaving was so, the easiest thing in my life would have been to stay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I was cast on the next movie. Life is beautiful. And making the decision to leave is my son was just born. I'm about to leave a secure job and I'm going out in the world to make zero dollars. <laughs>
and your wife's and behind the, you on this? And my wife's behind me. <laughs> and, and then I land, the, the Paramount asked me to head up their department. Um, and things just start coming together and you have got your ups and your downs. And, but I love, like, I love traveling. I love meeting new people. I love finding stories. I love writing. That's awesome. Yeah. So freaking rewarding, man. Like I could not, yeah, I can't picture it any other way. <laughs> that is super cool. Super cool. It's really inspiring. I mean, that's what, I mean, as animators, I would think, and you know, just, uh, share my own thoughts when you're when you're an animator is because you want to share you want to connect with the audience you want mm -hmm. to tell stories you want to <laughs> become whatever you know you want to be a dragon you want to you want <laughs> whatever you want to be you get to do that and I think uh, it's really inspiring um, just sharing your story yeah yeah it, it's uh and um yeah you know like I think younger artists they have this feeling like they're not worthy right like mm. you've got this insecurity about everything you're doing and um and the sooner you realize everyone is just doing their best we're all just trying to get through it and make it as amazing as possible everything just becomes a little bit easier mm. yeah. that's pretty cool yeah what were some of your favorite films um working at disney you mean the ones that I've worked on? Yeah. Um, I would say, I would say Tangled. Okay. How come? I would say Tangled and Frozen. Um, yeah, Tangled was, I, I don't even know where to begin. Like Tangled <laughs> was such an educational, like I used to think, I used to think I was, pretty good at doing surprising acting, like coming up with choices that would get a reaction in dailies. And then um, all of a sudden you're paired up with Glenn Keane, <laughs> right? And then it's like, all right, it's on. So I would bring Glenn my shots we would print out my shots on animation paper and then he would do drawovers on my shots. Man. Talking about having diarrhea. <laughs> having <laughs> one of the greats. Say. Do you imagine having one of, having a legend, his office was two for mine. <laughs> he was always like, hey, Lino, how's it going? I couldn't hide from <laughs> um, And the difference between my work and what he drew over, yes, it could have been a difference of the width of an eyelash, the tweak of a corner up, the tilt of a chin down to show more sclera in the eye. It, you know, every single time <laughs> he did something to my shot, and I, I can share this stuff too during the lecture. Oh, that's awesome. Every single time he did something to my work and you can find it on my Instagram and Twitter stuff. I've posted stuff okay. of Glenn's drawovers. Um, always got better. Oh, hundred percent. Never did he do anything that made it never. <laughs> uh, so Tangled was one of those movies where I got better. I accepted that I wasn't, I needed help. Glenn was there for me. And then one day, and this is probably my greatest moment of my Disney career coming to like a culmination. The greatest moment of my Disney career is having a daily session that went pretty well, going back to my office, hearing a knock at the door, turning around and Glenn saying, how did you do that thing in that shot? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Glenn Keen is coming was, to me. <laughs> I was skipping in the halls for like two weeks. Um, but he was great. He came by to compliment me on an acting choice that I made. Oh, that's awesome. Um, and yeah, and again, I've got some stuff that I can share of um, 
I, I just listen as you guys can tell i go off on tangents <laughs> and a lot so that the difficulty is going to be to rein me in during this <laughs> don't worry don't worry i'll be there i'll be there <laughs> <laughs> but Lena, one of the things I love that you're talking about, and it kind of goes back to something you said earlier, um, it just stands out to me. And we've talked about this before. And it kind of goes, like I said, back to where you're talking about coming into dailies, not expecting to hit a home run, but to get that feedback, those notes. And it kind of just, even what you're talking about here with Glenn Keen, I just that being teachable, being um, humble to receive criticism and again that just goes back to a testimony from where you're at it's just that growth that growth from that you're learning you're learning you're you're putting that in that uh data bank here of what to do now next time and and uh really expanding your skill set and um and so i mean that be a good summary <laughs> oh, dude 100 percent. like um you're never done learning listen that's why we've got the best job in the world mm. Yeah. Right. We're not stamping aluminum pieces for a car and that they're the same every time. No matter how how much you've learned, that next shot that you're going to do is going to kick your ass. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That yeah. next thing you're going to do is going to be so different from the previous shot that how are you going to approach it? What have you learned? What are you going to bring to the table? You've been animating a quadruped. Now you're animating a fish. Right. Like it's we've got the best jobs. Yeah. 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 And I like how you said, like, we're, we're always learning. That's why, you know, I said, even myself, you know, like, you know, very, taking notes. very well, I'm very comfortable, but I know that I'm going to be jumping into Lino's mind and I'm going to challenge, you know, I'm going to bring some thoughts and I want, you know, I shared some, uh, some of my, my, my process uh, a few weeks ago, just, you know, cause coming from doing more game and being on set, uh, doing motion capture and directing actors and stunt coordinators and, and such. I still want to learn other things. I talk to, you know, writers and, and, and in different actors. So I'm always acquiring new things. And I know that there's more to learn that I can actually apply into my day-to-day -day, uh, job at, at Ubisoft. So mm. I think it's going to be a phenomenal learning for, for, for everyone who participate. And he's going to be showing his own, the process. That's great. You know? That's great. So what about Frozen? So you mentioned Tangled and Frozen. What was um, about Frozen that kind of really stands out to you at your time at um, Disney? Well, I mean, fr Frozen uh, Frozen was just such an amazing experience. Like, I, we can have a whole podcast, not just that. <laughs> I mean, first of all, the way, the reason why Frozen, a movie like Frozen happened is because of Tangled. Right, Tangled was so important for Walt Disney Animation Studios, and um, and the style and the choices that we make. Like, if you watch Tangled today, that human car human caricature style animation, it's legit. Yeah, like, you know, it looks awesome. It looks beautiful now. Yeah. Um, and then you know, just implementing things that I learned and. And working so closely with Jen Lee and Chris Buck, the directors of the movie, and and the studio leadership, um, and having people in the room turn to me, you know, in edit and story and animation dailies, like being someone that was part of building that movie was so rewarding. Um, that that yeah, like. Being in dailies and seeing the seeing let it go for the first time at, at the end of every single sequence, we would all go into the theater with the big screen, and we would watch the sequence for the first time as a team. And watching that let it go sequence for the first time as a team, it it, it was undescribed. Like you can't even. We were like emotionally gotcha. Yeah, we yeah. all just felt like, my God, this is incredible. <laughs> like we could not describe it. Like, is any is it just it was so honest and the performances in it and the song and um yeah, it was just an incredible experience all around. It's I, it, I was at a daddy-daughter dance, um, and I hadn't seen the movie yet. I didn't hear heard the song before yet, and uh 
I think just, I mean, a fraction of a second, they played that song, 50 little girls, <sighs> like at the same time, I'm like, what is going on? And oh, uh, just fell in love with that, you know? And so it kind of that same point where you're like, there's something unique here with the, with this song and, and character and moment, you know? I think Frozen proves that at the heart of stories, if if it means something to you as a filmmaker, you're going to find an audience, maybe a small audience, or you'll be lucky enough to have a large audience. But if it's something that touches you, it's something that you should pursue and make. Gotcha. Right? Because the world needed that movie at that moment, right? Like the act of true love being family and not being a romantic element, it's exactly what the world needed. And it's something that we believed in when we made it. So gotcha. yeah, Frozen for me is one of those journey moments that, yeah. You guys capture magic. It was yeah, magical. For like sure. the fact that it impacted so many people and and it like it resonated and like it it it, it um yeah it, uh, and for some reason I'm thinking in French as sangrela it means it it, it rings true like mm. it it felt like we were part or we felt that we could be part of that that story mm. or resonate with us so right right it's really magical yeah. I don't want to take up too much more of your time. I got a couple other questions though. Um, you've moved positions. You've been an animator. You've been animation director and lead. You're in directing now. What is it now that you're enjoying about this industry and art form that you're doing? And what do you miss about being an animator? That's easy. That's an easy question. That's the easiest <laughs> question all day. What I miss <laughs> is putting on my headphones or as the young people say now earbuds uh -huh. putting your music on closing your door and just working on the craft mm. i miss that and all that matters are those frames and that pose that you're crafting Very that's cool. your whole universe <laughs> is working on that shot and frame every single frame manipulating it so that it's giving you what it wants. I really, really miss that. Um, but I love being the author of my movies, right? Like I'm a very, as much as I was an in insecure animator, I'm an insecure writer. Like, and, you know, during COVID my wife, kept encouraging me. She's like, you know, those ideas you always pitch me, why don't you write them? <laughs> no, no, no. Who's going to, who's going to care about my writing? And the two things that I wrote during COVID, they both got picked up. Oh, killer. And I'm, that's what I'm in development now on. It's because I took the time and said, F it. I'm not a great writer, but maybe the idea cuts through. Mm -hmm. Maybe the emotion, maybe the rootability of the protagonist, maybe all of that stuff will cut through and the reader will see it. And that's exactly what happened. And they're both, I'm not going to say they're autobiographical, the projects, but they're very, very much reaching in to my childhood and my experiences. Close and to you home. Heard great directors and filmmakers say, um, and maybe it was Joe Ram, the great story artist at Pixar that said this, but the more personal your story is, the more universal it becomes, mm -hmm. right? And because we're humans and we all share the same emotional experiences. Right. So, um, yeah, I love to so hear. Um, let, me, let me share one thing, too. <laughs> if you're it. nervous as an animator, being in dailies as people are reviewing your shot, imagine <laughs> the feeling of being at a general all audience screening of your animatic being played in front of the general public watching a rough work in progress storyboard animatic and you're sitting there watching them watch it. It's out of body. It is the <laughs> most bizarre, unhuman, Cruelest, <laughs> weirdest 
experience I think an <laughs> artist can ever experience. Um, and to this day, it's just a nerve wracking thing. Um, I like the cruelest adjective in there too. That's yeah, the you're dealing like, with you're people, just, man. You're just standing in front of fear itself. Right? <laughs> it's just like, you feel you're being judged. Yeah. Everyone's questioning and you're just like, like you're dealing with human oh beings. My, man. I don't know. Like it just eats you up when you're presenting something <laughs> like a rough form, just to kind of like, this is what it's going to be. And Oh my goodness. It's, it's flashbacks. <laughs> oh man. Sweats, it's, man. It's, sweats. <laughs> oh, what an experience. When do you, when we would be able to see what you're working on? Is there any ETA? Um, I think, I think the plan is that there'll be an announcement in a few months. Okay. Yeah, don't say too much. I, I got to take care of my, my, my boy. Okay. <laughs> you know? All right. <laughs> yeah. There, there's, um, um, uh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah some, some, it's, some... it's all we need to know is that, uh, we're fortunate enough to, to have them teach our, you know, teach at I animate anyone who joins the workshop is going to be like blown away. We're mm. going to share a lot. And, you know, when the timing comes right, you could talk about it more okay. during one of the, you know, the following workshops. So I'm just taking care of you. I don't, <laughs> I got to take care of the team and that's, that's, that's right. That's the goal. We'll always <laughs> take care of our people. <laughs> well, Lino, um, that's probably a good way to end it off then if we can't talk anymore, but no, I really appreciate it. This has been a great podcast. Um, I'm really excited for the workshop again, not just, I think for the experience, but for what you bring to it. Um, you have a depth, I think that is, uh, very unique um, in what you've worked on, both your highs and lows, as, as you've mentioned. I think it's going to be super cool and um, informative, um, but it's been great to be able to talk with you uh, and, and get to know you a little bit. So really appreciate Dude, you on this you podcast. Thank you so much, guys. Very yeah, cool. Thank you so much, man. I mean, It'd we're so lucky to have, to have to have you being so uh, um, honest and sharing and letting other animators know, like, it's a journey, you know, we often say that it's a journey and that they get to come and share their journey. We get to be part of their journey as well. And, yeah. and they're not alone and that we're here with them, you know? So thank you so much uh, for doing this. It's gonna be so Finally, fun. finally, man. Finally. <laughs> yeah. Let's do it. Awesome. All right. Thanks, with thanks that, everybody. we are out. Thank you, thank you. Man.